So I'm just going live a little bit early so that I can make sure that um, everything is going to work out all right. I came to discover as I started to, uh, to prepare today that our internet connection here at Christchurch is really awful in the parish kitchen. So I've set up my own little provisional kitchen here in the narthex of the church.
Hello, how are you? Pretty darn good. I'm doing my cooking show up here because as it turns out, our internet connection downstairs is really cool. Oh, yeah. I couldn't broadcast video from down there. So you'll likely have to go into the sacristy yeah, from I'll that side. I'll go around. Come around. I think the last excellent outing we had was to the Fat Tuesday. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah. Because I had just gotten back from, from vacation in Curacao for uh, Shrove Tuesday and got the message that we were shutting down. Who are you? Well, a good early evening to you on this Shrove Tuesday. I am the Reverend Don Davidson, the interim priest in charge at Christ Church Anglican in Bolton. Welcome to this first episode of Cooking with Spirit. Last year, I did a similar show, but I called it Eat Simply That Others May Simply Eat. And in it, I used incredibly simple ingredients to make delicious meals and each week kept a tab on how much I was saving on the grocery bill by using those simple ingredients, and at the end gave that money to a feeding ministry that fed the poor. The only thing I discovered with that was, I really like to do fancier cooking, and the simple things weren't nearly as much fun. And so that sent me to thinking about, how can I do this in a way that would be completely fun for me, and still do something to help the feed, feed the poor. And so I've renamed the segment as Cooking with Spirit. And each week I'll make things that are a little more fancy. And on the last week, my vision is to have a little silent auction for who will get to have the dinner for two that I've created. And whatever that silent auction brings in will be... The, uh, the gift that I give to the local feeding ministry here in Caledon. So um, I'd like to begin with a little bit of a theological reflection. And today I just wanted to think about why do we do this Shrove Tuesday thing? And why do we think it has to involve pancakes or pachkis or some other form of bread and sausages and that's all dating back to the gospel that we'll hear tomorrow a gospel that talks to us about the tools we will use to walk a 40-day walk that helps us to grow in our faith those tools are self-examination prayer almsgiving, and fasting. As we begin this Lenten journey, we know that in one way or another, we have been called to give up something, to fast from something. And so the tradition grew up that as we were shriven, which literally means to just come and confess and be forgiven, that as we prepare ourselves for our 40-day walk through Lent, one of the first things we need to do is get temptation out of the house. And so on the day before Lent, with sort of a last hurrah of celebration, we got the leaven and the fat out of the house to prepare us to fast. Now, I have to tell you, I grew up in a funny little town, the town of Tilbury, 
It was, in those days, pretty well split directly down the center. One side was in Essex County. The other side was in Kent. One side was essentially all French Canadian families. The other side, all Anglo Canadians. One side, Roman Catholic. The other side, essentially Anglican. And the funny thing about it was that as a result, almost everyone in the town had some sort of a Catholic root behind them, be that Roman Catholic or Anglo-Catholic. And so on Shrove Tuesday, the conversation at school would always begin with all your friends about what are you giving up for Lent? What will your fast be? The problem with that for me so often was that um, the following day and for the rest of the four week, it resulted in a great long period of grumbling and complaining about how hard this self-denial was. Rather than being a spiritual uh, tool that helped us to grow closer in our relationship with God, it was an opportunity to quetch and complain. And so in my adult years, I've tended to encourage more taking something on for Lent, doing something that helps me to grow in my relationship with God. I remember an ad that came out from the church ad project in the United States that said, it isn't your chocolate or your cheesecake that God wants this Lent. It's your Sunday mornings. So perhaps in Lent, we commit ourselves to give a little bit, bit more time in worship. Give a little bit more time in personal prayer. Give a little more almsgiving to help those that are in need. One year, since Lent is actually a season that's <clears throat> about uncluttering our spiritual lives, I went about each day in Lent looking at one spot in the house, whether it was the junk drawer or my pantry, and taking the time prayerfully to declutter that spot, to bring two bags with me, one for the stuff that just needed to be cast off. One for the stuff that could be donated. And then to return that spot with a lot less clutter. That's its own form of Lenten fasting. And so tomorrow, as I do every year, I will invite you to keep a holy Lent using those tools of prayer and almsgiving, self-examination, and fasting in order to help us to grow in our relationship with God and come to Easter ready to celebrate the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, whenever I do these cooking demonstrations in any parish, one of the difficulties I come up against is, well, there are three of them, actually. First of all, I'm celiac, and so I cannot have any gluten in my diet, so all of my foods have to be gluten-free. Secondly, I struggle to keep control on my blood sugar, and so I severely limit any sugar that goes into any recipe I prepare. And finally, I have high blood pressure, so generally speaking, anything that I make is naturally going to be low in sodium. And you might think, wow, if you take all those things out of a meal, what's left? But I have to tell you that over the years, I've discovered that you can do amazing things with, with, without those ingredients. So my decision today, since I've usually found that uh, gluten-free pancakes are a pretty bleak substitute for the real thing, I'm going to do a demonstration making wonderful gluten-free fruit crepes, berry crepes. And so um, 
I'll just walk you through it. I may jibber jabber a little bit more about um, Shrove Tuesday and Lent as we go along, but um, I'll also give a commentary on what I'm doing. And uh, hopefully at the end, we're gonna have something really nice to look at and I'll get to enjoy when we have our virtual pancake supper at five o'clock. So the first thing we're gonna do to begin is well, these are the hardest eggs I've come across in a long time. We're going to beat three eggs, good large eggs. Now, I usually, in my own house, use absolutely farm fresh eggs, and Peter Heron here in the parish gets them for me, but we had all of my wife's family here for a big birthday celebration on Sunday, and as a result, all of the eggs in the house were used up, and so I had to run out to the store today and get some more in order to do this recipe. So we want to beat these eggs really well. Usually I do this in my stand mixer, but uh, standing here in the narthex of the church, I have to admit, I don't have access to a stand mixer today. But that's all right. We can do all these things the old fashioned way. So the next thing we will add is just a little over a cup of milk. Whisk that in as well. Now we need three quarters of a cup of water. cup and a half of all-purpose gluten-free flour. Um, if the all-purpose gluten-free flour that you have already has xanthan gum included in it, then you don't need to add it. If it does not have xanthan gum, then you need to add um, just a little, like a little over a quarter teaspoon of xanthan gum in order to get that binding factor in your uh, in your batter. Now, as I look at how large this recipe is, I have to hope that my wife comes home from work with a pretty good appetite tonight. <laughs> And now, as I said, I'm pretty careful with the use of this, but I do need a little bit of granulated sugar in order to, uh, to sweeten this. And so three tablespoons of granulated sugar. batter is coming together just beautifully now. And finally, I've already melted this because it really needs to be melted to make this work. Four and a half tablespoons of melted butter. And 
We'll mix this all together really well. One last good whisking. Just move some of these things we no longer need a little further from the way. Okay, that looks very good. I'm just going to give this a quick wipe because I managed to spatter a bit of milk on it. There we are. Now we'll spray the pan with just a light coating of olive oil and then let it get nice and hot before we move on any further. Now we've got the olive oil is just nicely bubbling. It's only over medium heat. And we're going to put a quarter cup of our batter on here. And we'll lift it off the burner and swirl it, spread it out in order to get a nice circular. Well, with the pan that I've brought here, I don't think a quarter cup is going to be anywhere near enough. So we'll just add a little more and make an extra large crepe. Well, it hasn't made the most perfect circle you're ever gonna find, but in that respect, I'm not a terribly fussy man. Now, as that cooks, one of the things I believe about cooking, and certainly uh, it's a similar thing to what I believe about our worship as Anglicans, is while well, flavor is important, more important still is that any meal we put on should be a treat for everything about us. And so it's not just the taste of the food, it's the appearance of the plate. It's the sounds and the joy of the people gathered. It's the aromas that, are, that surround us. The, um, the experience of a meal should involve every aspect of our humanity. And that's the same, as I said, in our Anglican worship ethos. Our worship is designed with beautiful music, piano, organ, the bell, the sanctus bell that calls us to lift up our heart at the time of the consecration. It has artwork, banners, and stained glass. It has the, the incredible beauty of song, of sight, of smells. When we use incense in our worship, we're inviting that sense of smell to be indulged as well. And it's very tactile. As one of the collects says about the Eucharist, we have seen with our eyes and touched with our hands the love of God. Our worship draws every sense into it. And in the same way, a really good meal should involve all of who we are and what we, what we experience in the world. Now, as that finishes up, and I've flipped it, and it's cooking on the other side, a part of making a beautiful meal, in my opinion, involves making a beautiful table. And so I'm just going to fold a napkin. There's one already finished here that you can see. It's called the fleur-de-lis fold. And the whole idea is uh, to decorate the plate as much as the food does. The fleur de lis fold I got from a master napkin folder, and it is the fold that is used on every banquet table at Buckingham Palace. 
The first thing you do is you take your 18 by 18 napkin and fold it diagonally. And then take each of the outside corners and fold them up to the center. Like this. Then you're going to take your bottom corner and fold it up three quarters of the way on the center line like that. Then take that and fold it back down to the bottom. Now you'll flip the whole thing upside down. From one side, fold over about two thirds of the way. From the other, fold it back and tuck the edge into the corner. So you get something that looks like this. Now the fleur de lis, as you know, has three feathers, which is another name for this fold. Fold down the first and tuck it into that bottom ring that you've created. Fold down the second and tuck it in on the opposite side. And finally, fold down one thickness of the front. I'm gonna to have to abandon this for a few moments because I believe that that crepe is ready to move over onto the plate. So we will take our finished crepe, lay it on the plate. I have some lovely fresh strawberry slices. I have some raspberries to put inside. Next thing is golden berries. I kind of got addicted to them when I worked in the church in the Diocese of Colombia for a short time during my sabbatical from the Diocese of Huron. And anytime I see them, I just have to buy a few and remember those flavors and all that beauty of my time in Colombia. And now we're going to Fold over our crepe from either side, lay it out in the center of our plate. Now, because I didn't get it terribly round, unfortunately, it's not cooperating with me very well. Before I went live, I made a little blueberry reduction sauce, which was just made by putting a half a cup of blueberries half a cup of water and half a cup of sugar. And I'm gonna drizzle that over the top just to bring additional berry flavor. And finally, what pancake supper would be complete without some good old fashioned breakfast sausage. Now I have parboiled them in advance because there's nothing worse than getting them undercooked um, pork. And so all they really need is to be reheated and to be lightly brown. While that's happening, I'm just, just going to take a little bit of real whipped cream and put a bit of that on the crepe. I've decorated the edge of the plate with some, um, some other fresh fruit. And finally, to, to complete that napkin, I like to put a little flower in the front of the fleur-de-lis just to add some color and some contrast. And I chose these tiny daffodils today because today is March 1st, which is St. David's Day. And in the story of St. David, he told the Welsh people that they would be able to defeat the English armies if they would put a daffodil in their helmets. And the Welsh did manage to defeat the English. And so the daffodil became the symbol of Wales, the national flower. And so I've stuck a little daffodil in there in deference to the great Saint David. I also, as I made up this plate, just to bring a little more color, Put a little sprig of mint. 
It'll only be a few moments now and everything will be ready. While it's hard to give you an impression of the, uh, of the aromas of this meal over the internet, I do need to tell you that it is an absolutely delicious smell here in the narthex of the church. It may be a while before people can come and go through this entrance without, uh, without salivating at least a little bit. And there we are. I'll bring this over closer to the camera so that you can see a meal of fresh fruit crepes with sausage. Thank you very much for coming and joining me for giving this time to consider our preparation for our Lenten journey. And God bless you all as you head off on the road that will lead us to Easter. Thanks be to God.